Welcome, shalom again from the synagogue. This is the blog, the live blog now for day five of counting the Orma. Um, yet more thoughts and ideas and things to chew over as we're going through our Orma count. So I'm going to ask you a question today, an interesting question. Who is really one of the greatest? Can you think of the greats of, of Judaism and, and what names would you place if who was the greatest within our Jewish tradition? Who would you put up there, I wonder? So I'm sure that most of you would certainly put either Moses or Moshe at the top, or at least within the first two or three, I'm sure that you would put in Moshe Rabbeinu, although he was never a rabbi in that sense, but that's the title which has been given to him. He's certainly one of the greats, though, isn't he, within Jewish thinking, within, within Judaism, um, and revered in many, many ways. So what an amazing man of God that he was. You know, we can think of all of his qualities that are listed for us, and of course, many, many studies have been done on Moshe's life of who he was as a person. All of his qualities, his leadership skills, his, his ability to listen to other people, including his father-in-law and so on. Uh, all of these spiritual qualities uh, which this man exhibited and had in his life. And you know, one of the most amazing things that we, we read about him was it's just described that he was one of the humblest of all people that had ever lived. An amazing, amazing man. No one seems to have had the humility that he's had. That was, seems to be the really enduring quality that this man had and exhibited. But it wasn't just his humility, was it? I mean, we know this. The tenacity, spiritual tenacity of the man, having gone through everything which he had gone through in his life, you know, having committed some of the, the worst sins. You know, he, he murdered a man and tried to cover it up and uh, and then, then then goes into the desert for, for all those years of, of his desert training and um, coming again face to face with the Lord in the burning bush and so on. A man who had been through so much and then goes back to Pharaoh and faces Pharaoh and demands the release of, of the Jewish people from Egypt and everything. What a man, what a role model in so many, many ways. Humility, his wisdom that he exhibited, his ability to lead our people through the desert and hold our nation together as we come out as a, as a rag bag, really, of individuals, as slaves, and, and of those of the nations that we took with us as we left Egypt during that formative 40 years in the wilderness through Moshe's inspired and powerful leadership that then moulds us into a nation that we become at that point. The wisdom, the insight he had, the revelations that Moshe had. And on top of all of that, we then discover this is a man who walked closely with God. He had an amazing experiences of God. You know, you'd be very, very hard pushed to find a man ever in history that had the experiences of God that Moshe had. And often, you know, we, we often believe, as I find now, they tend to look back and disparage those experiences and just say, yeah, but he didn't really know God or whatever. It's absolute nonsense. Nonsense. I will have any day what Moshe had over what so many believers today say, this is the ideal of what we had. What Moshe had was amazing. I'll have that any day. I'll have the revelations that Moshe had. I'll have the experiences that Moshe had. I'll walk that closely with the way that Moshe walked. If that's what's on offer, I'll have it, please. Because the experiences and understanding and, and wisdom and insights I've got of God come nowhere near that that Moshe had. He was an amazing, amazing man in all of this. I'll have it, please. Moshe knew God. Let's stop, please, attacking him. This man knew God intimately, deeply. He had faith. And you know what? It's faith that counts. It's faith that brought Abraham in. It's faith that brought Moshe in. It doesn't matter. Abraham wasn't born Jewish, by the way. It was faith that brought him in. It was faith that created the people of Israel through Abraham because it's faith that saves in modern parlance. It is faith that saves, and it's faith that makes a difference. That is the walk, the path of Adonai. It's always been faith, and it's never been anything other than faith. You know what? Abraham didn't have the Torah, by the way. You know this. The letter to the Jewish community in Galatia argues this point so strongly and powerfully. Abraham could not have been saved by keeping the Torah because it wasn't around in his day, despite the obvious claims in other forms of Judaism today. But we know this wasn't true. Shaul, Rav Shaul makes this statement very clearly in that letter to Galatia. It couldn't have been any other way. It had to be by faith. 
Moshe had faith. Because of that faith, he knew God. He walked with God and had these amazing experiences and revelations. He was able to go up that mountain and be in the presence of God. Astonishing. So where am I going with this? We have to face the reality that despite all of this with Moshe, he didn't lead us into the land. It's incredible. He didn't lead us into the land. Moshe dies before he can take us in. You know, he's pleading with God, and we, we, we read about this. He would love to have been the one, having brought us through the desert, he wanted to be the one to finally actually take us over the finishing line and take us into the land. It was denied him because of his sin. I know the arguments and the rabbinic arguments are what was his sin and was it this and was it that and was it the other? Was it the striking the rock or not speaking? And, none? and we know the debates that go on. We've read the commentaries. We know this. It's, and sometimes the scriptures are, are, can be a bit ambiguous. It's difficult to necessarily pin down. I mean, the speaking, striking the rock scenario there, frankly, was nothing in comparison to murdering someone in Egypt. But let us move on. The point is, Moshe didn't and couldn't lead us to the promise and the inheritance of the faith. Why? Because of his sin. Because he was merely a man. He was absolutely unable to do this. Sin prevented Moshe from fulfilling the calling on his life in that way. So we're left with the question, when we examine history in this way, how do we get into the land? How do we inherit that promise? If Moshe can't be the one to take us in there, is there one like Moshe? who is able to bring us into the land, able to really bring us into the full fulfilment of what it means to walk as a Jewish person in faith? Well, if Moshe couldn't because he was merely a man, then we're obviously looking for someone who is more than Moshe, a prophet greater than he. Do we have one in Jewish tradition? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Because there was one who was actually metaphorically, spiritually able to fully lead us into the fullness of that inheritance, the fullness, if you like, of inheriting the land that way, both physically and spiritually, the fullness of it could only come from someone who was more than a man or a man who was sinless with what we needed. And that one, of course, is Yeshua Mashachenu. Only he is able to fully lead us in in a way that Moshe failed because of his own sin. Through Moshe, through Yeshua Mashiachena, we were able to be brought in. Moshe died, but didn't, raise, didn't rise from the dead. Yeshua died, but he rose from the dead. Death could not hold Yeshua. It held Moshe, but it didn't hold Yeshua. And you know, when we get into the thoughts and ideas about whether Yeshua was sinless and who he was and this, that and the other, you know, I'm reminded, reminded of the time right at the end of Yeshua's life, he's brought before the Sanhedrin. You know the passage well, he's brought before the Sanhedrin. And the question is basically raised there about, you know, was he sinless? Could someone be found to bring a charge against this man? And you'll know from the scriptures, I don't want to read them to you, from the Besorah, as, as, as quoted for us by Matthew Chow in his chapter 26. He says, The chief priests, the elders, and the council sought false testimony against Yeshua to put him to death. Found no one. Found no one. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found no one who could claim in any way reliably that Yeshua had committed a sin during his life. Definition of sin, by the way, is to break a commandment of the Torah. That's what the definition of sin is, to break a commandment of the Torah. No one could be found to prove that Yeshua had done this. And yet, isn't it interesting? By the way, I want to mention this as well. Because, of course, we know Yeshua debated with the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the, Pharisees, the Prushim in his day, and clearly... Because of the arguments there, whether it was the rubbing of the corn or the fast days and so on, you know the passage as well. It, clearly, he wasn't keeping the Torah according to some of the Pharisaic standards of his day. He was breaking it left, right and centre. And yet, when we find in the word he's brought before the Sanhedrin, these examples of apparently breaking the Torah were not marshalled as part of the argument where Yeshua had broken the Torah and therefore committed sin. 
I find that fascinating as well. He was failing to keep the Torah according to the Pharisaic standards of his day. There were plenty of examples to show how he didn't. They weren't marshalled at that trial. They could easily have been marshalled at that trial and brought and said, here, you've broken the Torah, because you know what? It was not halakha at the time that the Pharisaic understanding of keeping Torah was not absolute in the first century. And therefore, that was not the definition of what sin is. In fact, that's not the biblical definition of what sin is. Sin is breaking the Torah command as recorded in the Torah as given at Sinai to Moshe. That is the definition of sin. So what we find at that point is Yeshua had no one to accuse him. Yeshua was without sin. He was without sin. And therefore he is the prophet greater than Moshe and he is the one who is able to lead us fully, fully, spiritually and physically into the land. That is why now we're back in the land again in Israel right now. We're back in the land. Now is the time for the spiritual revival for our people to begin. We pray, we pray for the revelation of Yeshua as the Jewish Messiah, the Jewish Mashiach. He is Mashiach. Mashiach now, Yeshua now. He's Mashiach for our people right now in the land and wherever we are dispersed in diaspora. May the revelation of that sense of his being Mashiach, may that revelation be revealed now, we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening in.